Hey church, it is Sunday morning, so we're going to talk about God for a few minutes. Uh, we are in the season of Lent. This is the season that leads up to Easter, to Jesus' death and his resurrection and his ascension. And we're telling the story of Jesus like we do every year. And what I want to do this morning is I actually want to take a break from the Gospel of Mark just for Sunday. And I want to go uh, to the book of 1 Corinthians and we're going to talk about why we tell this story every year. We just want to remind ourselves of that every now and then. And so I want to uh, jump into that just real quick like. And we're going to be reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse 17. So this is what Paul has to say. Uh, but in giving this instruction, I do not praise you, because you come together not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that divisions exist among you, and in part, I believe it. For there must also be factions among you, so that those who are approved may become evident among you. Therefore, when you meet together, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in your eating, each one takes his own supper first, and one is hungry and another is drunk. Now, do you not have houses in which to eat and drink? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? In this I will not praise you. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This is the cup, or in this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and in doing so he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks eats and drinks judgment to himself, if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick, and a number sleep. But if we judged ourselves rightly, we would not be judged." But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord so that we will not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home so that you will not come together for judgment. The remaining matters I will arrange when I come. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, so... Um, the Corinthian church is notoriously divided. Uh, they divide about who belongs to who as they try to align themselves with prestigious Christians. They form up groups of, along, that, uh, along those lines. Uh, in the chapters leading up to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, they're going to fight about who is in the know and who doesn't know any better. Bless their hearts when it comes to matters like eating meat sacrificed to idols. The chapters just after 1 Corinthians 11, they're going to fight about who has the coolest spiritual gifts and those who, for instance, speak in tongues, they are cooler than everybody else. And it's obvious in 1 Corinthians 11 that there is a division there as well. Paul at first doesn't tell us what the division is. It could be that they were dividing when they came together to eat over uh, any of these issues. And so, you know, the cool kids who speak in tongues, they sit at the cool kids table and the rest sit down there somewhere. But it seems that what's going on in 1 Corinthians 11 is rather they are dividing between rich and poor. Uh, we know that in the Corinthian congregation there were uh, some rich people and there were a number of poor people. First Corinthians 1 tells us this. Paul says, consider your own calling, brethren. Not, not many of you are powerful. Not many of you are wise. It indicates a diversity there. And we know that practically speaking anyway, they had to have some wealthy people in Corinth. Here in First Corinthians 11, they're all coming together as a church and that requires space, even if it's a relatively small group. And so that had to happen somewhere and normally that would happen at some rich member's house who had the square footage to accommodate the church. And it's actually that fact that gives us a clue as to what's going on. Because in the ancient world, it was very common for people of some prestige or some renown or some means to give banquets. It was a, a fairly regular occurrence. And we know quite a bit about how they gave banquets. And it turns out that the way that the Roman world practices banqueting looks a lot like what Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians 11. 
in the Roman world, when uh, they would host banquets, the wealthy would invite those who could kind of bolster their own esteem, their own status. And so they would invite people of esteem and status to these banquets. And the more uh, status that you had, the better seating you got at the banquet and the better food you got at the banquet, and the choicest portions you got at the banquet, and as your status goes down the line, because not everybody can be highest, as your status goes down the line, then you get worse seating, and you get uh, smaller portions, you get worse cuts of the food, that sort of thing. And by the time that you reach the lower levels where many of the Christians in Corinth would have been, uh, where they were slaves, where they were freedmen, or they were just the everyday average poor who had to work on a day-to-day -day basis for a living, either one, you normally weren't invited to the banquet at all, or two, you would have been kind of shoved down at the very end and you could just get whatever leftovers were left. And this seems to be, for all intents and purposes, what's happening in 1 Corinthians 11 as Paul describes this situation. He says, some of you are getting there and you're going ahead and eating your supper and you're getting your fill. you got plenty. Everything's going right for you. And this is a circumstance where at a wealthy patron's house, they uh, had wealthy members who could, could, could afford to show up early. They, they were at their leisure. And so they went ahead and they ate, right? And then there were those in the church who uh, were not wealthy, were not prestigious, were not at the upper crust of society and they had to work because Sunday wasn't a day off for them and they could only come to the assembly after all of their work was done for the day and by the time they got there down at the end of the table there wasn't anything left and so Paul says some of you um, go hungry and some of you get drunk and this seems to be the situation that was going on but for our purposes this morning, one of the things that I want to emphasize as we look at this situation, as easy as it is to beat them up, is this, this would have been completely natural to them. Uh, prior to several years earlier when Paul came through and brought them to Christianity, brought them to Christ, and they gave their allegiance to Christ, this is just the way things were done in the world. Uh, it never would have occurred to someone on the upper end of Roman society to to even consider waiting for those who are lower in status before they eat their food or to be concerned about whether or not they get food. That's just not how banquets worked. And so uh, the problem that Paul seems to have here is that um, these Corinthian Christians living in this Roman context, they are coming into this assembly in which they proclaim allegiance to Jesus and they, they tell Jesus' story. This is what he says later. When you eat the body and you drink of the blood, you are proclaiming Jesus' death until he comes. You come together to tell this story, to give allegiance to this story, but you're living like Romans. You're living uh, like the old way of doing things, even while proclaiming allegiance to the new way of doing things. And so um, Paul is going to take issue with them over this. It's kind of like when Jesus uh, says in the Gospel of Mark, we talked about this a few weeks back, that there is this matter of trying to put new wine into old wineskins. And so when you put new wine into old wineskins, the new wine is uh, inevitably going to destroy the old wineskins. If you want the new wine to survive, you have to have new wineskins. The new message of the gospel cannot sit comfortably without destroying the old ways of doing business. The Corinthians cannot proclaim the newness of the gospel while sitting comfortably in the old ways of doing Roman banqueting. And so Paul says, no, 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 no. If you're going to give allegiance to the story of Jesus, if you're going to call out the story of Jesus, if you're going to proclaim it in the bread and the wine, then you have to let it change your life. And indeed, it seems for Paul that the key to the entire thing, the, the thing that will address their, um, their Romanness, that he says brings contempt on the church, that he says uh, humiliates your sisters and your brothers who don't have anything, this thing that ought not happen, this thing that Paul condemns them for, this thing that, that Paul can't praise them for, the solution to it is, he says, to remember that when you come together and you proclaim the story of Jesus, you're doing something serious that ought to have an effect on your life. And so he says, for instance, that when you come together and you break the bread or you drink of the cup, that you are doing this in remembrance of Jesus. This is, he says, what I taught you. This is what the Lord taught us. And that idea of being done in remembrance of Jesus is more than just a cognitive remembering. That's not just playing some memory in your head as you sit quietly in a pew taking the bread and 
the wine. Rather, it goes back to the Passover. This is where Jesus was when he instituted the Lord's Supper. And the Passover was not just a retelling of Israel's redemption. It was, it was kind of a recapitulation. It was a placing of people in the present time into that great story in which God redeems them. They become a part of the story. The redemption that God gave Israel and Egypt becomes the redemption that we enjoy in becoming a part of this story. And so it is saying this is what roots me in reality. This is what identifies me. This is what shapes me and forms me and gives me value and tells me what my values are and how I should look at the world and how I situate myself in the world. This is fundamental to my existence. And so all of those things are at play for Paul when uh, you partake of the Lord's Supper. When you tell the story of Jesus' body and his blood through the bread and the wine, when we tell the story of Jesus, it makes a call on us. When we tell the story of Jesus, it shapes us. And for the Corinthians, the way it shaped them was to challenge the way that they were eating with one another. If you are going to proclaim the story of Jesus, then you have to kind of honor this dynamic in Jesus' life that he has called us to, where he tears down the walls that you are upholding. In Christ, there is no wealthy and there is no poor. In Christ, there is no slave and no free. In Christ, there is no honorable and dishonorable. In Christ, there is um, no privileged and unprivileged. In Christ, all of those walls have been torn down. So why, Corinthians, are you upholding those walls even as you take of the mill that calls you to a different way of life. And for us, you know, it may not be the mill associated with um, our worship services. I don't think at Fernville we have a problem with getting together and waiting on one another when we have our potlucks. As a matter of fact, um, the only time that I was really late for a potluck since I've been with you guys is when we had the Christmas banquet and it's because we were coming in after work and it was nighttime and we had to drive in from East Tennessee so we were one of the last ones there and we still went away hungry that's not our problem but we might have problems in other areas this might challenge us in other areas when you tell the story there's an obligation that you examine your life Paul would say to make sure that you are living consistently within that story that you are not as it were walking into a Christian retelling of the story living the Roman story and so one of the reasons why we um, tell the story every year, from Advent through Pentecost, we tell the story of Jesus every year. We take six months uh, out of our year as a congregation to tell the story of Jesus is because in proclaiming the story, we give our allegiance to the story. And the story is supposed to work on us. And we want to let that story do that work. We want to have that firm foundation, that core from which we can live our lives. This is the same reason we partake of the Lord's Supper every week. We want to tell that story so that it shapes and forms and molds us, that it puts us in the world in a certain sort of way as a certain sort of people. Because there are going to be those areas, most of the time areas that we've never even considered before, areas that we've never even thought about before, where we are living just as Americans or just as Westerners or just as moderns or just as Tennesseans or just as whatever when we ought to be living as Christians and the Lord's Supper our baptisms and the songs we sing and the scriptures that we read and the sermons that we preach and the stories that we tell about God ought to challenge all of those things <clears throat> and so Paul helpfully by the way calls the cup the cup of the covenant this is of course what Jesus called it in his gospel as well and it reminds us that when we partake of the cup, we are partaking in a renewal of the covenant. That by partaking of the cup, this is why Paul treats it with such seriousness. It's not as if we just kind of stumble to it and we accidentally eat this bit of bread and we accidentally drink this bit of wine or, or juice or whatever it may be. But he says, when you partake of the body and when you partake of the cup, you are committing yourself again. You are renewing the commitments you made at your baptism to be a certain sort of person, to be a certain sort of people. The people who take communion act differently in the world. And Paul would seem to indicate in 1 Corinthians 11, and I would want us to think about today as we continue through starting again next week, the story of Mark, um, that the world desperately needs communion-taking, baptized people who have pledged allegiance to Jesus, who act differently than the rest of the world in ways that are not superficial 
or trite or incidental, but are meaningful and well thought out. Paul says if you're going to take of the cup, if you're going to break the bread, if you're going to tell the story, you have to wrestle with the implications of that. And so, as is my practice, I'm not saying that we do bad at this. I don't have any particular person in mind. I don't have any particular thing in mind. Rather, what I want to do is I want to let Scripture that is raising these sorts of questions. Mark is raising these sorts of questions. Paul raises these sorts of questions for our life as he deals with the Corinthians and their situations. I want us just to, to consider the questions, not just to push them away because they might be uncomfortable. To consider where our strengths lie consider where we might need to repent, to consider where we could do better, to uh, dream and imagine beyond where we currently are. And so I leave you with that challenge this week uh, as we enter into this season of Lent, as the tensions in Jesus' story begin to rise. Because at the end of the day, we want to position ourselves in that story intentionally and reflectively and repentively so that we're not standing against Jesus, but we're walking with Jesus. But I want you to remember, standing against Jesus is easy to do. And so we tell the story every year. We ask the questions, where do we stand? Because if you're going to tell the story, you have to live the story. All right. This is actually the second time I've recorded this today. The first time my camera messed up halfway through, so I'm doing this on my computer. And uh, we do have to upload it before worship starts in an hour. So I'm going to go ahead and stop because I've got to upload this thing. And who knows how bad my internet's going to be. So let's pray. And then I'm going to let you loose on the world. All right. Lord, grant us the courage and the strength and the faithfulness and the wisdom and the creativity to live out your story with boldness and integrity. Lord, give us hearts and eyes to know who you are as we seek to follow you into your world. And we come and we pray as a family, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from the evil one, for yours is the kingdom, the power, the glory, now and forever. Amen. Church, we love you. We miss you. Um, have a great week. I hope that it is at least a less snowy, icy week for you than it was last week. Stay warm. Be safe. Um, love like Jesus.